Good afternoon. I am calling to order our regularly scheduled meeting of the Intergovernmental Relations Committee. My name is Elizabeth Glidden. I'm the chair of this committee. And we have a quorum today. We have, uh, I'm joined by Council Members uh, Fry, Kano, and Andrew Johnson. Um, I will uh, just note we have two members absent, but uh, one of them, uh, Councilman Rasami, has just had a uh, baby girl, his uh, family's just had a baby girl, and uh, Council President uh, Johnson is ill. So otherwise, I know they would be anxious to be here because we have a very exciting presentation. I think we're going to have uh, Ms. Bergman uh, kind of give us an overview of this, but we are excited to welcome our state demographer, and it looks like we have a full house of city staff from all over the city who are anxious to hear what she has to say as well. Ms. Bergman. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. Sasha Bergman uh, with the IGR Department. Um, we are very excited today to have Ms. Susan Brower, our state demographer uh, in the office of the Minnesota State Dem Demographic Center. Um, she's been with the State Demographic Center since 2012 and previously had worked at the Wilder Research Center and the Population Studies Center of the University of Michigan. Uh, today we asked her to come here and present a, a slightly shortened version of a longer uh, presentation that she gave to a joint House and Senate Task Force on Economic Disparities in January. Um, I think that presentation was a couple of hours and then maybe a couple, another additional hour of questions. So we asked for a, a little briefer version, but nonetheless it will be robust. And um, just for your reference, we have provided a longer document of a, re a longer report called the Economic Status of Minnesotans. I believe you all should have hard copies, and we'll make sure that if it isn't already online, that it's posted online to our website for uh, folks to access. That might provide some additional details at times if there are questions, um, or just some more information if you're interested in digging in further. Um, but unless there are any questions to start, I would be happy to turn it over to Susan Brower. All right, well, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, Ms. Brower, we're really excited to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's good to be here. Uh, what my formal um, bio doesn't say is that I was born and raised in Minneapolis and live here today. So I have a, <laughs> so you have a, stake a personal in what we do. interest in these numbers. So it's, it's good to be here. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to give you an overview of what our state looks like uh, and, our, and our city um, with respect to growing diversity in the city, in the state of Minnesota, uh, the presentation I gave to the legislative working group uh, focused on the state of Minnesota. And at that level, we're able to get a lot of detail that we can't get at the city level. So I'll be sharing a lot of those numbers with you today. Know that if I could show you those things for the city of M Minneapolis, I sure would. Uh, but but uh, we just start to lose uh, the clarity when we get down to the city level. So I'm gonna start by showing you uh, some of the trends towards greater ethnic and racial diversity in Minnesota and in Minneapolis in recent decades. Uh, talk a little bit about why this growth matters to the state and to our city. Um, and then I'll review some of the data coming out of the last census release in September that uh, there was a lot of media attention on uh, and, and a lot of policy attention as well. Um, based on a, a, a worsening economic situation uh, for black Minnesotans or a perceived worsening economic, we'll get into it. Um, and I just wanna review that and tell you kind of where things are with, with that uh, analysis. And then finally, for the time remaining in the third part, uh, I will be sharing some of the detailed data that we've put together in the report that you have. Um, drilling down into uh, cultural communities in Minnesota, kind of in a way that we haven't looked at them before. Um, and so with that, we'll start just with the demographic trends. So today, Minnesota's populations of color jointly total more than 1 million people and make up about 20% of the state's population. In 1960 in Minnesota, there were only about 50,000 people of color. 22,000 of those identified themselves as black or African American, 15,000 as American Indians or Native Americans, and about 4,000 Asian Minnesotans. At that time, at the, the beginning of this graph that you see here, there wasn't a systematic way to count 
uh, Latinos. Uh, that happens later in the 20th century. And so, um, you know, beginning in 1980, we start to see uh, Latinos in Minnesota on this graph, even though they lived here prior to that time. It's just the time when the census uh, started capturing it. Similarly, uh, the census in 20, I'm sorry, in 2000 began uh, allowing people to say that they were more than one race. And so at that time, we see uh, people identifying more than a single race, and we see that uh, show up on this graph as well. In Minnesota, or in Minneapolis, we get something of a different picture in terms of the growth. Here we're looking just since 1990, but you can see that a large share of the growth, particularly since 2010, has been among black or African American uh, residents in Minneapolis, but also among white residents. Those are kind of the two groups that have seen the most growth just in the last five years or so since the last census. And so what that does is uh, it kind of balances out this, this growing share of populations of color. So around the state, you would typically see that growth in uh, the share of populations of color, but here at the city level, uh, that uh, rising share has kind of flattened just because you have so much growth uh, among a younger uh, white population here. So just to give you a sense of how populations of color are distributed uh, across the state with respect to both Minneapolis and Hennepin County, uh, this graph is showing you that about 10% of American Indians of Asian residents and of uh, just above that at about 14% of Latino residents of all those in the state are living here in Minneapolis and about a quarter of black or African American Minnesotans live here in Minneapolis. When you extend that to the borders of Hennepin County, you can see that that share grows considerably uh, where almost half of black or African American residents in the state of Minnesota living, are living in Hennepin County. Uh, so the, the city and the county uh, contain a fair share of uh, that diversity that we see, of diverse populations that we see across the state. When we look at where growth is coming from statewide, it becomes very obvious that populations of color are, is fueling our growth, are fueling our growth. Part of that has to do with uh, immigration, international immigration. And part of that just has to do with the fact that we have younger populations of color and a growing share of people who are likely to be in the parenthood ages. So that's kind of its own internal momentum. Um, what we see in almost every county, the graph on the left, uh, in Minnesota is some kind of growth. If you're seeing green, it means that populations of color have grown at least by one person. In some areas, it's, it's much more rapid. And, th and then uh, the map on the right is telling you that in the, in the red, we're seeing the white non-Hispanic population decline in those counties. And in the green counties, the white non-Hispanic population is growing. But I show this to you just to show you that this is an important piece of our growth overall. Uh, our diverse populations um, will continuously continue to be into the future an important source of that growth. Another piece of kind of big context for you is that we're entering a phase right now that's going to be very different from what we've experienced in the past with respect to growth, and particularly when we look at labor force growth. So we're looking here at what labor force growth looked like in the past decades, and in the 1990s, we were growing very, very rapidly uh, as a state, as, a, as uh, the labor force in the state was growing very, very rapidly. It would grow about 38,000 people each year during the 90s, or about 380,000 over the course of that whole decade. Uh, in the 2000s, even over the course of the recession, we still continued to see very, very rapid growth, uh, and that fueled economic growth. Uh, 
What we're seeing this decade and what we're projecting for future decades is much slower growth. And that's happening because baby boomers are getting to the point where they're moving out of those working ages, we're moving out of the labor force. And we have a big group of millennials moving in to take their place. Uh, but it's not enough to both replace that big generation that's exiting and make up for growth on top of that. So this is a very typical pattern that you see when, when you have an aging community, an aging state, an aging country. Uh, but it's another piece of context to think about the disparities against, that we will not have an endless supply of potential workers going forward. It's much more likely that we will um, grow very, very slowly and that we will need to find workers uh, in, in places in ways that we haven't seen in the past. We have a question for you from Council Member Andrew Johnson, and I'll just note for my colleagues, I think we have enough time that if you wanted to ask a question in the presentation, we can do that, but we might, um, we'll pause at the end too, and that might be when more people ask broader questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question. You, it sounds like kind of answered it, but uh, I'm just curious with these particular numbers, does this account for migration patterns or is this strictly based off of the existing population? Minnesota? Madam Chair, Council Member Johnson, uh, this includes migration. Uh, so we take um, estimates of what migration has looked like recently. We actually increase our rate of migration because we think that that will be a response uh, given the slower growing labor force that will see increased migration. And even with those assumptions, we still see a much slower growing labor force. Um, We've looked at it pretty carefully to see kind of what level of immigration would have to happen, in migration would have to happen uh, to not see a slowdown to this degree. And it takes an awful lot of people. <laughs> That's right. my scientific term, an awful lot. Um, so. And then I guess my uh, piggyback question off of this would be, do you have any sense of uh, the demand in terms of labor force growth? Uh, Madam Chair, Councilman. Uh, Right now, we're pretty close to a one-to-one -one ratio at the state level, meaning we have just about as many people looking for jobs as we have job openings. And this is a very tight labor market relative to what we've seen in recent years where we tend to have many more people looking than we have jobs. So given that, we're kind of at this point where job seekers and the number of jobs has, has come to an almost one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, and going forward, we know that we'll continue to see slow growth. Um, it, it's a real concern for employers to, to think about where they're going to find the workers that they need. All right, thank you. I had uh, one more question from Council Member Fry on this topic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Brower. Uh, the, the, the previous graph, it, it lists uh, black and African American. Is that inclusive of East African and Somali populations? Back here. Yes, correct, right there. So the, the it says uh, black slash, a, slash African American. Is that inclusive yeah. of uh, Somali and, Afri and Eastern African populations? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Fry. Uh, it is in this graph, and what I'll get into uh, in uh, the graphs uh, later on is I break that apart by Somali Minnesotans, by Ethiopian Minnesotans. I don't think I share them in this presentation, but they're included in the report that you have. Um, this is just to give you a general overall sense of these broad racial groups, but um, in many ways, they it falls short of really describing who's living here. Thank you. Yeah. So if we even consider the last handful of years since 2010, we have already begun to see that uh, we have a decline in the number of white Minnesotans of working age and a robust increase in the number of people of color of working age. So this isn't something that is way out in the future. This is something that has already begun to take shape. Um, I'd like to move now to talk about the data for black Minnesotans uh, that has received a, a lot of attention. Um, 
there was the September 2015 release of the annual census data that kind of brought this into view for people, um, kind of sounded the alarm that economic conditions for black Minnesotans were deteriorating. That's really an overly simplistic picture of what really happened, and I'll show you um, some of the data that we've looked at since that initial release to give you a sense of, of what we can tell, um, and also I'll be clear about what we can't tell. So as background, the data that I'll be presenting for the rest of the presentation today and those that were released last September all come from the Census Bureau's ongoing survey called the American Community Survey. Uh, residents identify themselves as belonging to one or more racial groups shown here. Uh, and the American Community Survey, just for your reference, is, is enormous. It's the largest population survey that we have. It collects data from about 77,000 housing units in Minnesota each year. Um, and it covers a large range of social, demographic, and economic questions, making it the most comprehensive, richest data that we have for understanding racial and ethnic disparities in our communities. But even with this very large sample, when we begin looking at specific subpopulations, if we look at specific geographies, the city level, for example, with specific characteristics, the sample sizes can get very small very quickly, and we always use an abundance of caution in interpreting any single year change or any differences across groups. So in September, uh, when the Census Bureau released its 2014 numbers, people were surprised to see what appeared to be a decline in black median household income uh, and a concurrent rise in poverty for black Minnesotans during a time of economic growth for the state overall. And here you can see the difference between the 2013 and the 2014 estimates. That's, that's the difference that uh, people were paying attention to this. Uh, the smaller bars on this graph uh, are showing a confidence interval, and that just reminds us that these estimates are coming from a sample and there's some fuzziness around uh, that estimate. Um, the new numbers uh, that we got in 20, it, just in September were rightly concerning for a lot of people. Uh, and so, since that time, we've done some addi additional analyses to better understand whether the change we see here are real economic changes, whether it's a compositional change due to the makeup of the group, or whether it can be seen as a decline that's just a matter of sampling error or the fuzziness around the estimates. So I'd like to point out at this point that the median income for black Minnesotans has been very low for some time. Uh, this series goes back to 2008, uh, but earlier in the census data, we see the uh, similar uh, levels as well. And you get a sense for how very low median income is for black Minnesotans when you compare that to other racial groups and to the median of all households in Minnesota. So at about $27,000, black median income is less than half the median for all Minnesota, Minnesota households. Uh, a similar picture holds when you look at Minneapolis households. Now those bars that I showed you are much longer because there's a lot more sampling error around the estimates at this lower level of geography, but you can see that the estimate for black median household income in Minneapolis is about $19,000 a year compared to about $50,000 for Minneapolis households overall. Similarly, the rate of poverty for black Minnesotans, moving again back to, to Minnesota, um, is very high. So 38% of black Minnesotans live in poverty compared to about 12% of all Minnesotans, uh, three times the, the, the rate of the state overall. In Minneapolis, you get oh, a higher- I'm going to just pause. Sorry about that. Uh, we had a question from <laughs> Council Member Andrew Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question on the households uh, data uh, that you had up there. Was that estimating, are these households uh, the same size when you're factoring these numbers? Are you? doing it like per capita uh, of household members or are there differences in terms of the size of the household? So I could see if you have a smaller household, 
Um, there's an implication there. If you have an even larger household, you could have even more of a gap and more of an impact um, income-wise. Madam Chair, Councilman, uh, these numbers do not uh, control for the size of the household, and that's something that um, I point out quite often, and I prefer actually not to look at, at household income numbers because you, when you have a younger population, you tend to have smaller household sizes if you have a very young population. Uh, and conversely, if you have a very old population, you tend to have smaller households as well. So um, this isn't a per capita number. This is just a, a household level number. When you look at the poverty numbers, you're looking at the same income as you would be looking at for median household incomes, but it's scaled to household size. The poverty thresholds change depending on uh, the size and age composition of the house, so it gives you a little bit better sense of what maybe the true underlying income is without the confusion of, of household size. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So we see a similar picture in Minneapolis uh, with respect to the disparity. The disparity is a little bit less between uh, black or African Americans and all uh, Minneapolis residents. Um, it's not three times the size, it's about two times the size, but still very large. Uh, and overall in Minneapolis, the poverty uh, rates are higher than, than for the state overall. When we begin to look at other economic indicators, including employment and earnings, a much more complex picture emerges of what's been happening in recent years. So first we see a steady decline in the unemployment rate from a high of 20%, this is for black Minnesotans, uh, just after the recession to about 13% in 2014. So these numbers are high relative to other racial groups and to the state overall but they appear to be moving in the right direction since uh, the recession. Um, we have seen an income, or I'm sorry, uh, a growth in employment among black Minnesotans during that same time period that we saw a decline in median household income and an increase in poverty. So um, they can't be summed up entirely the changes that we saw in income as an issue of growing unemployment over that time period because that doesn't appear to be what was going on. In fact, between 2013 and 2014, we saw growth in the number of black Minnesotans who were employed. Uh, here we're looking at the change in employment for black Minnesotans between 2013 and 2014 on the far left, you see full-time employment. In the blue bars, you're seeing where the, the earnings are less than $35,000 a year. In the yellow bars are showing you where earnings are greater than $35,000 a year. In the middle, you see the part-time employment. And on the far right, those two bars are showing you all employment, part and full-time together. We see that between 2013 and 14, there was very little growth in full-time employment for black Minnesotans. Uh, losses in year-round employment appear to have been replaced by employment with lower earnings, and part-time employment at lower wages far surpassed the growth uh, of part-time jobs with higher earnings. So in total, we get a picture of employment growth, but it's concentrated uh, in part-time work at the lower wages. Another factor that's contributing to the complexity of the changes in income for black Minnesotans between 2013 and 2014 is that this group has been growing very, very rapidly. And we have to understand the changes in uh, median income and poverty from year to year in the context of these compositional changes for the group. So this survey isn't tracking the same people over time. It's a snapshot in time at different groups of whoever uh, happens to be living in Minnesota at the time. Um, we're not only picking up on those folks who are here all the way through, but we're picking up on folks who moved in during the time period, as well as any changes that might have occurred from people who left. 
So since 2000, the Census Bureau is, estimates that we have added more than 100,000 people who are self-identify as black or African-American uh, since just 2000. The growth of the black population in Minnesota has been shaped by migration, as it has here in Minneapolis. Both internal migration, people coming to Minnesota from other states, and international from countries outside of the U.S. And here you can see the complexity of the black population when you begin to look deeper into the composition of that very broad racial group. So here I've broken down Minnesota residents into four groups, into Somali immigrants, including their U.S.-born children, other immigrants. In this category, they're not broken down separately because the groups are too small to be able to do that with, with a fair amount of accuracy. Uh, but included in, the, in that other immigrant uh, piece of the pie there would be Nigerians, Liberians, Ethiopians, uh, and their U.S.-born children, Minnesota-born African-Americans, and African-Americans born in another state. That's, that's who's included in this pie here. And by doing this breakdown, we begin to see a heavy influence that migration plays, not only from other countries, but also from other states. Only 25% of black Minnesotans who live here now were also born right here in Minnesota. And knowing how these subgroups are faring gives us a better understanding of the overall income numbers for uh, the larger, broader racial groups. So we saw earlier that 38% of black Minnesotans have incomes below the poverty threshold among Black Minnesota Somalis, uh, we see a much higher rate of poverty, about 58%, rather than that 38% for uh, blacks overall. Um, we see the lowest rates of poverty among other African immigrants, uh, many of whom migrated here for economic reasons, already speaking English and having gone through a formal education system. Uh, we also see that the poverty rate for Minnesota-born blacks and those born in other U.S. states is 42 percent, 36 percent, respectively. And taken together, this graph tells me that the economic instability we see for black Minnesotans, it's not only a story of international migration. That's something sometimes people uh, want to attribute it to. It's about international migration. That's why poverty is growing so quickly. But we can see that there are very high poverty rates for people who have been here all along. Uh, we also see that this, the storyline of, of increased poverty because of immigration isn't the whole story, uh, as we see lower rates of poverty, considerably lower rates of poverty for uh, immigrant groups other than uh, Somalis. So this uh, example, I should say here, this example uh, is gives some of the insights that you can only get by disaggregating, getting lower, uh, more specificity than those broad racial groups. Um, and I think they help kind of provide an understanding of, of some of the di dynamics that are going on um, and some of the contexts under which economic instability is occurring for Minnesota's populations of color. Um, as the challenges are, are very different for different groups. I don't have a clear, concise answer for why income changed between 2013 and 2014, unfortunately, but I think that all of, of the things you see here, that sampling variability sure could play a role in that. Uh, the change between 2013 and 2014 was significant at the 90% confidence level, but not higher levels of confidence. So we can't rule out that it was, uh, that, that no change happened. We can't rule in that um, absolutely a change happened between those two years. We know that there's a lot of movement in and out of Minnesota with respect to our black population, and that's gonna have an impact on these numbers, on the income numbers. And then we saw a pretty clear indication that there was some growth in the lower end of the income distribution 
uh, that's related to part-time work uh, at lower uh, wages. Um, so all of these things appear to be going on longer term than just 2013 to 2014. But I would say that together these kind of form what I see as, as the most kind of salient explanations for, for why the change happened. So I wanted to ask a couple questions um, before you go on to your next section. Um, so, um, so this this piece about the part time job growth, I was interested in learning some more about that uh, from your perspective. And I'll say we also um, just did um, uh, a um, uh, presentation in the city that was prepared by staff that looked at. Um, various indicators um, around poverty in Minneapolis. And so I just mentioned that because one of the things that uh, was presented in that report to us by our staff was that Minnesota has a greater percentage of people working multiple jobs than otherwise in the Midwest or in the United States as a whole. I don't know if that's, uh, I, I was gonna forward that to you <laughs> before you, but I, obviously I didn't. So I don't know if that is something that you could speak to as well. Are we unusual here in Minneapolis or in Minnesota in terms of how our work is looking and then who is doing that work, um, looking at the, the part-time work and how that then is affecting uh, economic opportunity for people in, in Minneapolis and um, black residents and people of color. Um, Madam Chair, yes, those are all uh, good, deep questions. I don't have um, I don't have a deep knowledge on how we compare uh, with respect to multiple job holders to other places. Uh, I can point 